Good morning on this Sunday, October 2nd, and welcome to the Georgia Gang. A new poll out in the U.S. Senate race has Senator Raphael Warnock five points up over his Republican challenger, Herschel Walker. Also, Governor Brian Kemp looks to the suburbs for support as Democrat Stacey Abrams talks about her support in the African-American community. Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens puts a halt on any redevelopment of the soon-to-be-closed Atlanta Medical Center site. Melita, Phil, and Janelle are all here, and Theron is joining us from our nation's capital. The debate and discussion begins right now. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia Gang starts now. About six weeks until the midterm elections and recent polls still show a possible split ticket here in Georgia. A Fox News poll this week shows Governor Brian Kemp up seven points over Democrat Stacey Abrams and Senator Raphael Warnock up five points over Republican challenger Herschel Walker. Now, Libertarian Chase Oliver could force a runoff in the U.S. Senate race, which would mean another four weeks of campaigning. Phil, to you first this week, your thoughts on these latest poll numbers. And we've seen other polls where we've seen Walker up about two points. That's right. It, it's going back and forth uh, with these numbers. Uh, the real clear politics uh, average shows that uh, just exactly what this poll is showing. I think it is headed to a runoff. What's very interesting, though, Lori, coming out of this poll, and I think we all ought to pay attention to this, is there's still 13 percent undecided. I think that's fairly accurate. Uh, there's room for Herschel Walker to grow. And uh, in fact, uh, Warnock, the incumbent, is actually um, losing some votes among independents. That's another takeaway from this poll. Two months ago, uh, he was uh, getting 20% of the independents. Now that's down to 1%. Very interesting. Theron, do you think that Senator Warnock could be picking up some momentum here? Absolutely, and I think the poll reflects that. Um, every poll that I've seen, except the one poll you mentioned, Lori, has had Senator War not leading this race. And the one thing that I am very encouraged by is his support amongst Democrats, but also he is doing well with the middle, uh, moderate voters who he's been really laser-like focused on campaigning to. But I think that this race is going to make a big shift in Warnock's direction once the debate happens. And even as he continues to go on the attack, he's going to probably change his message, Lori, and be more about his record and about uniting Georgia and how he's represented all Georgians. And so I think he'll have the money, he'll have the message, and he'll have the momentum going into early voting. We're talking a lot about these independent and moderate voters. And Janelle, the AJC had an article this week about Herschel Walker campaigning on more conservative issues, including a federal abortion ban um, and really focusing on his opposition to transgender males competing in women's sports. Now, these are issues that will obviously fire up the Republican base. But what about these independents? Yeah, that is a concern of mine. And, you know, this is interesting. I, I'm not surprised that he is trying to make sure that he's speaking directly to Republicans because I don't think Warnock is picking up um, momentum. I think Walker may be losing Republicans on a, on a certain scale. Um, and the reason why I say that is because because we were part of the campaign, part of the primary, we talked to people who are um, who, who feel nervous about sharing their play or some of their concerns. And I do think that we need to point this out. We can't tell people that we're not they're not seeing what they're seeing when it comes to the candidate, qu the quality of the candidate. What we do need to explain to people, and what I have explained to people, and what Republicans have 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 shifted back to Herschel because of this conversation is that. The Senate, the Senate is, is like a board of directors for the country. Their votes are what matters. Warnock has already shown us how he votes. Warnock has already shown us what he thinks and what's going to happen. We don't need anyone else in there, and especially when we have an opportunity to replace him, we don't need to send him back and have him voting on things that's going to hurt this country. So I am about making sure that, yes, we acknowledge the weaknesses that we see on our side, but let's make sure we understand that Herschel will get in there and he's going to vote in the direction that we need him to vote in in order to get this country back on track and that's what matters at the end of the day. Melita, I don't think you can turn on a TV and not see these ads against uh, Herschel Walker, the, these domestic violence allegations, these abuse allegations. Do you think that that's having an impact? I think it is because by a 20 point margin more of the Warnock backers, 63 percent, than the Walker backers, 43 percent, say they support their candidate enthusiastically. So I think what you see is that Walker's supporters do so with reservations, and perhaps that is a result of these ads. But I also think that we see Warnock working bipartisanly to solve some of the problems facing Georgia's. He has a new ad out with him standing in a, I guess a, I don't know, some kind of peanut thing, all the way up to his waist, talking about how he worked with 
Tommy Tuberville in Alabama to work on some farmer problems. Well, this week, Senator Warnock is also focusing on tax breaks for electric vehicles because the new federal law could put some automakers like Hyundai at a disadvantage. And of course, now we've learned that we got word that Morgan County Judge has sided with the opponents of the proposed Rivian plant over these tax breaks. Phil, Rivian is one of my clients. Now, this is disappointing news, obviously, for economic development leaders in Georgia. There surely will be an appeal to this ruling. Well, I'll get to Rivian in a minute, but I want to just discuss uh, <laughs> Raphael Warnock is trying to correct a horrible mistake he and the other Senator John Ossoff did. They didn't read parts of, of Biden's uh, massive bill that's inflationary, but that's another topic. So now Warnock's coming back trying to claw back uh, tax credits that were denied in the Biden big bill that passed that he voted for. Uh, it's a little late. Um, I'm not sure if he can get the bipartisan support that he needs to do that because the fact that the Biden, the Biden bill that every Democrat voted for took away the tax credits that Rivian needs in Georgia, that Hyundai, that Mercedes, it's, it actually stabbed in Georgia's economy in the back, these two Democrat senators did, and now they're trying to make it right. Now, it, it, Lori, to your point on the Morgan County judge, mm -hmm. uh, that will be appealed. It's gonna be very important for a couple reasons, and I know we're gonna debate this. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the uh, the judge said the Joint Development Authority for the four counties didn't do their due diligence on the company and that the revenue didn't look good and so that means that the bonds um, should not have been issued. Uh, 1.5 billion we're talking about mm -hmm. here and also um, if the bonds aren't reasonable that could have an impact around the state. Theron, talk about this impact of this this judge's ruling in, Mar in Morgan County and, and the ramifications down the road. Well, Rivian has been a um, project that we've talked a lot about on this show. There were a lot of proponents, um, but there were also some critics and people who were not uh, feeling like they were fully briefed and fully uh, aware of how this uh, job creation, uh, this job creator, this company coming to their area. And so, you know, the, the judge made the rule and it, and it will be appealed. But, but Lori, I want to go back to Senator Warnock and what he's, I think, is doing with this bill. And it's not, it's not what... Um, um, Phil is explaining. I mean, yes, the <laughs> legislation did pass, but he has a right as a U.S. senator to basically make uh, changes and introduce another bill that will basically give a company like Hyundai a little bit more time to ramp up. Um, and so this is a bill that all senators should support, particularly if we want uh, Rivian and Hyundai and others to succeed and give them these tax breaks so they can have time to ramp up and give them the, um, the incentives that they need. And so I think that Senator Warnock will stand by his vote uh, on the bill that President uh, Biden is very put, um, proud to push out, just dealing with the issue of inflation. Um, but this legislation is something that I think that Republicans and Democrats should compliment Senator Warnock for introducing. A lot of debate over tax breaks. Phil and then Melita. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Theron, you're wrong. It was an amendment on these tax credits for the EV industry. Uh, it had nothing to do with a lot of the rest of the bill. So admit that he made a mistake. Now he's trying to correct it. That's what's going on here. Melita. No, I, I don't, I don't. Love her. Go ahead, Melita. Well, I, I think what it does is it allows a longer period of time for the compliance with a very tiny part of a massive piece of legislation which overall is very good for this country and very good for f elements of climate change prevention. Janelle. Yeah, I just think that Warnock jumped the gun trying to impersonate Republicans when it comes to uh, p putting in tax breaks that actually benefit. When we put in ta bre tax breaks, we put in tax breaks that are going to help these businesses to be able to actually hire more people. When we don't put in tax breaks with stipulations that tell you how much you, can, you need to charge you know, your cars or, or the, the, the annual salary of people and that you sell to. That's the type of stuff that affects the bottom line. And when we don't have a in, a insight into the books and the financial books of these companies, companies, it is not fair to create these type of stipulations. So yeah, he jumped the gun trying to appeal to Republicans by saying the word tax break, but this is not the way we do it. Alina. Well, there's a 33 page ruling in this Morgan County case that shows the due diligence Republicans didn't take when a gubernatorial administration gave a lot of tax breaks to bring the Rivian plant here. And I think that 33 page ruling gives um, a lot of people things to ponder about future economic development efforts and the way these tax breaks are passed out. And we'll be discussing and debating. Coming up, Governor Brian Kemp campaigns in the suburbs with Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin. 
Have a question or comment for the Georgia Gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. Governor Brian Kemp hitting the suburbs in Metro Atlanta this week with Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin. Theron, the suburbs once GOP territory really have changed in recent years. Do you think Republicans can make strides here? Well, I think Republicans and Democrats will make strides. I think that the suburbs right now, Lori, has really changed. And if you look at what has happened since the 2018 election, we've had 1.6 new registered, 1.6 million new registered voters uh, in the state of Georgia, and a, and a bulk of those newly registered voters live in a lot of our suburban areas, particularly in the North Fulton, Cobb, Cherokee, Forsyth, and, and going up north. But you also seen some growth. Uh, in middle Georgia and southeast Georgia as well. And so I think the governor uh, put a person up there in Governor Yunkin who uh, was able to mobilize voters in the suburban parts of Virginia to pull an upset victory in his race. And I think you have already seen Democrats like Stacey Abrams and the entire ticket and Senator Warnock spending time in the suburban areas as well. But I've said this over and over again. I think that both parties are going to do a good job of actually turning out their base. But a key part of the Biden coalition that was successful in 2022 and ultimately, I'm sorry, 2020, and then ultimately in 2021, that coalition consisted of disaffected college-educated suburban white women. And so I think the governor and others on the Democratic side know that they are a very key important voting bloc, and you'll see many candidates coming from all over the country um, and, and people supporting the candidates uh, that would spend a lot of time in these suburban areas. Phil, we've seen Stacey Abrams in rural Georgia. We see now Governor Kemp hitting the suburbs. What, what do you make of this? One thing doesn't change in the suburbs, and that is the issue of crime. And that's where the Republicans and all polling in Georgia and elsewhere are very strong. And you're seeing independents uh, in the center moving over to the right on this. The Democrats, like Stacey Abrams, she was for defund the police. Now she's backpedaling because she knows that's unpopular all of a sudden. Warnock doesn't mention anything about the criminal gangs where we have a crisis in the state. The Republicans are taking uh, notes from Glenn Youngkin's homework that he did in Virginia, a Democrat state where he was elected governor. So the Republicans are rightly in the suburbs and elsewhere hammering crime and education. Education transparency especially is a huge issue the Democrats are way behind on. Melita, this week Democrat Stacey Abrams had a call with African American journalists and said black voters are not deciding between her and Governor Kemp. They're actually deciding if they're going to vote for her or not vote at all. Do you agree with that assessment? And, and what are you feeling in the Democrat, the Democratic sphere right now? I've said all along that this vote is all about who turns out their voters and who enthu enthusiastically receives supports from the grassroots up. And we have to remember that Yunkin won before Roe v. Wade was overturned and the um, issue of reproductive health care and the restrictions Republicans want to push on reproductive health medical options for women are an issue amongst suburban women voters of both colors and of all socioeconomic groups. And I believe that that issue will be a deciding factor for many, many women in the suburbs and even in rural areas. We're seeing rural women candidates in North Georgia, in South Georgia, hammer this issue with their voters because people are upset about the anecdotal and news headline stories they're hearing about how these restrictions have affected medical care for all women. Janelle, what about this argument that Glenn Youngkin mm -hmm. won, you know, won before Roe v. Wade was overturned? Yeah, yeah you know, I, I don't, I haven't thought about that. I don't think it matters. I think that because because what Youngkin was really running on was the education piece. So it wasn't about abortion or being pro-life or pro-choice. It was about education. And I so so, but but when it comes to Abrams and it comes to the black vote, I do agree that there is a concern. And I spoke with Kelvin about this this morning as a black as a black man. I was like, do you think black men are automatically going to vote? Republican and he was like my concern is that they sit it out and that was his, yeah, that's what he said and I and I actually agree with that that is a concern we have to give them something that pulls them into our side what Governor Kemp does very well is that he speaks to issues he doesn't speak to melanin he speaks to issues whereas Stacey Abrams is, is making this about the color of your skin whereas whereas Kemp is speaking to issues that men in general speak towards you don't see black men magic you see black women magic because that's something that's emotional and that's something that that, that women hard, uh, jump onto. So I do think that we have to be careful and make sure that we are giving um, black males who are fed up and who are who want to move from the Democratic Party a policy and a position that they can get behind um, and so that way we can we can hold them. I want to move on because Democrat Alicia Thomas Searcy 
Matthews said this week she's being ostracized and excluded from her own party. Melita Searcy is running, of course, for state school superintendent against Richard Woods. Um, it's clear some Democrats are not willing to support her because she's a big proponent of school choice. Is that what this is all about? I mean, do you support her as one of the Democrats on the panel? Winlist did not endorse her because we chose to focus on legislative races because abortion has always been the lens for our endorsement process. And I think what you see here is some of her past positions coming around to hurt her within the party because some of her positions in the past were not in line with general Democratic support for public education. Farron, over to you. Yeah, listen, um, I've known Alicia thomas Cersei for over 20 years. Uh, I, I ran her very first campaign when she became the first, uh, I'm sorry, the youngest and first African-American elected official in that area of Cobb. And, and when she went into the legislature, she was, uh, legislature, she was, she was the youngest. And so she did, um, you know, express her feelings on Facebook. Uh, I think what she said definitely raised a lot of eyebrows. Uh, there were some um, information that was being disseminated that did not include her. But more importantly, I like what she's done since the post, uh, Lori and, and Melita, is that is that she's just focusing on winning this race. I mean, this is a woman who won her primary uh, without a runoff. She won 159 counties as a Democrat. And I know there's been a lot of talk about her uh, school choice and charter school support. But the fact that they're trying to label her as a, a Republican, and, and I'm not saying that the Democrats are doing this, is um, and, and the party that she pointed out, but others, it's just, it's just not true. And so ultimately, look, we got to be united. Um, she said what she said. I think there have been a lot of conversations that have transpired since her post about uniting the party and making sure that we support the entire ticket. And I know that that's what I'm going to do. Phil, and yeah. ultimately, you know, as we move forward, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Phil, let me ask you, because we see some of this strife in the Republican Party, not necessarily in the Democratic Party. Well, you do see strife in the Democratic Party. It's just that the corporate mainstream media doesn't focus on it. And uh, this is a good example. I mean, you refuse to endorse her. You, ref you endorse other constitutional officers statewide. You know, yeah, she's a Democrat. But I tell you what, a lot of African Americans, according to the polls, along with everybody else, like school choice. And uh, this is where the Democrats, again, are on the wrong side. Janelle mentioned education is a huge Republican theme, including school choice. And uh, I think this is, has to be stressed. I'll give credit. To, uh, to her for uh, standing up for something she believes in. And um, I, think, I, I, I think it's terrible that, you know, the Democratic Party is not a big tent. They're trying to exclude her. All right, we'll leave it there, folks. We're out of time. Coming up, Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens has a message for developers eyeing the Atlanta Medical Center, which will close in a matter of weeks. Not so fast. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. The fight over the closure of Atlanta Medical Center continues. Mayor Andre Dickens signed an order halting any type of development on the 25 acre site. Melita, to you first in this block. We see another health care company come in and open another medical facility. I mean, is that even feasible? Well, I think what we have to do is, I think it's good to have the time to figure some of this out. You know, this is a, a more than $100 million piece of property. Wellstar has had possession since March of 2016. And during all this time, there have been property tax abatements because it was operating as a nonprofit. And so I think making sure that nobody can go in and just blow up the property real quick and build over it and bull bulldoze and build over it is a wise move. And I think, you know, Governor Kemp's proposal is a band-aid for a situation that needed maybe two rolls of gauze and a bunch of tape. You know, I mean, this is a complicated thing. And in Georgia, Atlanta, it, with 6.1 million people, is the eighth largest metro area in the country behind Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia, both of which have four level one trauma centers and Atlanta will have only one. And uh, even Miami, which is right behind us in population, has two. And so this is a situation that requires visionary leadership, and those in charge did not apply that before Wellstar announced they would close. So what about this halt to a redevelopment of the site? I'm fine with what Mayor Dickens is doing, halting. I hope we can get another level one trauma center. I think everybody would agree with that. I don't think, I don't know why you would attack Governor Kemp on all of this. Uh, 
you know, for all practical purposes, and this doesn't get a lot of publicity, uh, Atlanta is virtually a sanctuary city when it comes to refugees and illegal aliens. The police don't ask for anything. And this is what's swamping the emergency rooms. Uh, go to any emergency room around here. It, it, it's a problem. We cannot continue to have this influx because we do need, to your point, uh, more trauma centers. And I think we got to take, that's why open borders is such a big mistake, but that's another topic. Well, this week the Braves were honored at the White House for the World Series win, and then politics got in the way. A Washington reporter asked the White House press secretary about rebranding the team name and the tomahawk chop. Janelle, I'll go to you first because yeah. what the Washington reporter doesn't understand, and maybe the White House press secretary, is that there have been so many conversations between the Braves and the Native American community. There has been open dialogue, yeah. maybe unlike some of the other professional teams. And so when I saw that question, I was like, you're going to rain on their parade? Here right. they are getting honored? <laughs> after, after coming to the White House, knowing that it was this administration that it impacted our ability to have the um, all-star game so they were they were being kind but but let's talk about this so in 2020 there was a number of discussions it's no secret that you know my husband and I are season six ticket holders and we participate in the a-list member events and we listened to a PR um, agent who said that they had conversations with the Native American community they had conversations with Native American chiefs about this and that's why they so we, they did remove the the foam um, um, tomahawks um, and they kept the name but at this point we're looking literally just going like this with our arm. I mean, you can't ban me from going like this with my arm. I can chop as much as I want to. So, I mean, at this point, it's just really silly. Um, I think we need to stop this. And if the Native American community is okay with it, then who are we to say that, nope, 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 you don't know, you don't know as good as I know, or so, you know, I'm gonna change it. It's no different than when I hear, particularly white liberals say that black people cannot have, or, or that abortion is, affects us the most um, in, a, in a positive way because our rapport, and all these other things. Well, guess what? In our community, most of us came from poor backgrounds. Most of us came with, we were born without a silver spoon in our mouths and we did just fine. So I do think that we need to stop trying to represent people when we're not a part of the community. Theron, I'll take it back to you, back on to the Braves. Yeah, look, I think, first of all, I mean, President Biden's words and congratulating the Atlanta Braves for winning the World Series, I encourage our viewers to go back and listen to that. He talked about the team and the history and how we, you know, worked so hard to get back to that moment of winning a World Series. Now, when my friend, John pierre um, was asked a question, I worked with her on the 2012 Obama campaign, and what she responded and said is that, look, she thinks it's, it's worth a conversation. And as Janelle know, I go to the Braves games a lot as well. I probably don't go as much as, as Janelle. And while I'm there with my friends, most times my colleagues and clients, I opt not to actually do the chop because I know how it is so offensive to the Native American community and others. And so I make that choice not to participate in the chop, but that does not make me less of a Braves fan. And so I see many other people, guys, when I'm there not doing the chop as well. Now, the overwhelming crowd, yes, they do it. But when my wife and I and others go to the game and my son, when he gets old enough to know what's going on, um, I don't think we will be doing the chop. We will leave it there, <laughs> folks. Coming up, winners and losers. <laughs> Time now for the week's winners and losers. Barron, since you're out of town, we'll let you go first. All right, well, I am in uh, Washington, D.C. at the Congressional Black Caucus uh, Conference. This is an annual conference that goes on every year, so definitely want to highlight uh, all the Congressional Black Caucus members in our delegation in Georgia. Also want to make Georgia Tech a winner. They announced this week that they're um, raised money through a fund to rename their student center to the John uh, Lewis uh, Student Center. So I definitely want to make sure I compliment them. Also, the city of Atlanta was recognized this week as one of the best places to live by U.S in the U.S. by money.com magazine. And then lastly, want to give a big shout out to Coca-Cola uh, for teaming up with a lot of diverse local artists across the uh, city okay. of Atlanta uh, to incur some murals and, and one soon to come in the AUC. Janelle. <laughs> okay, my winner this week is I went to a conference and we meet, I met so many viewers. And so my winner this week is Steve Sperling. Um, I, I, I told him I would give him a shout out. I hope he kept his promise and didn't tell his wife until the shout out came. But Aww. there you go, Steve. It was great to meet you. And my loser this week, we didn't get on get to the subject, but it's the people who vandalized the contractor Miller Gorey's home, mm -hmm. Brassville and Gorey. I think that's completely idiotic. We're
we're moving from passion to stupidity when we start um, encouraging people to vandalize contractors who have nothing to do with the decisions of what they're building. And I'm glad you brought that up. Phil. <laughs> well, I have got a loser, and that is the Biden administration and that clueless press secretary <laughs> that uh, Theron was praising. I mean, to step on uh, the national championship celebration was outrageous enough. But the main Cherokee Nation is a big supporter of the Atlanta Braves, too. I just wanted to get that in. Right. My loser is in Columbia County. A principal did not want in an elementary school a dress-up day for the 1950s because that was a time of social injustice. Well, you know, every decade has a problem. So he tried to ban this. This is absurd. It's warped political correctness. Melita. Well, I can go with Janelle's loser. Um, I think a winner are the citizens um, around the proposed Rivian plant who filed that lawsuit to bring uh, those questions into those practices into question. And another loser is the Buckhead Cityhood movement because um, a poll shows that the Republican candidates who back that movement are losing ground. And we'll leave it there, folks. And of course, our thoughts and prayers are with all of our neighbors dealing with Hurricane Ian. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.